Hello, Pamela. You're muted. Yes, I am, but that's fixable. Hello, quiet Pamela. <laughs> okay, so you got to show everyone your shirt because it's awesome. Okay, so it is turtles all the way down. It makes me stupidly happy. It came from a place called Fuego's. Oh, and, and so for people who don't know, what is the turtles all the way down? Where does that come from? Um, so at the end of A Brief History of Time by Stephen Hawking, he talks about how a different cosmologist was giving a lecture uh, on basically the origins of the universe, and there's a woman in the audience who just got very frustrated with all of this mumbo jumbo and declared it's turtles all the way down. And there's various mythologies that uh, have the earth is carried on the back of the turtle, and Terry Pratchett's books, of course, have Discworld on the back of a turtle. And uh, so it just sort of became a, a thing, and, and I actually have a, a habit of when I travel, if I only get one thing, I'll get like a little turtle. So this is the turtle that's from Greece, this is the turtle that's from Portugal, and, and so I just have like little turtles scattered all over my house, because it's turtles all the way down. Right, and so whenever there's some complex concept in cosmology that needs to be explained, and there's some kind of controversy, you, know, you just hand wave and go, it's turtles all the way down. Yes. Then that it's explains the universe. What is dark energy? Turtles all the way turtles. down. All the yeah. way down. What is dark matter? Also turtles all the way down. Weekly interactive massless turtles. Um, non-baryonic okay, so, turtles. <laughs> non-baryonic turtles. Uh, all right, so so now you have recovered from your hanging out of fun? I think so. We're still working on... Uh, so, so we discovered when, when you and I started this hangout that... Uh, I cannot be uploading YouTube videos while we have a hangout going on. Please so don't. my goal for today is to to work on uploading the individual segments to our Astrosphere Vids YouTube channel, uh, but not while we're doing this hangout because that kind of worked the inner tubes. Uh, but people still have some time to contribute and donate yes. and pledge for the for the uh, Cosmo Quest hangout. And form. And one of the most awesome things is the folks over at Planetary Resources have said that they will give this stunning slice of meteorite, and it's like a big old slice of meteorite that just has beautiful um, uh, crystalline structures within it uh, to whoever donates the largest uh, sum by May 18th. Wow. So donate by May 18th, and uh, if your donation is the largest, and uh, right now, it's a very easy target to hit. Um, our our average donate, our median donation size is thirty dollars. Our average donation is eighty dollars. Um, there's been a few much larger ones, but those all occurred during the Hangoutathon itself. So this this special thank you from Planetary Resources is open from uh, the Monday after the Hangoutathon Hangoutathon until May 18th. So uh, donate as an individual and say, hey, I want to see more science, and there's a chance that Planetary Resources will say thank you with a slice of meteorite. Thanks, Planetary Resources. Yeah. yeah, they're, yeah. I mean, they're, you know, they're going to get a lot more of that. I mean, they're out there uh, mining the asteroid belt for all of its minerally goodness. So, Well, they will in the future. In the they're future, there, they yeah. will. And so they'll get a million yeah. of them. And so for, you know, for now, it's exciting. Later on, They'll be filling up the planet with uh, gold and <laughs> platinum and Well, I mean, that's the space. thing is they're looking to do the mining so that they can build things on orbit, not so they can, like, bring it back down to the planet. This is the, the construction materials for future exploration. So it's a pretty cool model. Yeah, no kidding. Uh, okay, so for those of you who have no idea what it is that you've stumbled into, uh, this is a live episode of Astronomy Cast, our long-running uh, space and astronomy podcast. This is going to be episode 345, and we're going to be starting a new series on numbery things. And so the first number we're going to be dealing with is 39, and that is the number of the launch complex uh, at Cape Canaveral, where pretty much everything historic related to the U.S. Uh, space exploration happened. Manned space exploration. There's other historic. launch complexes. Historic. Man I think the Mariners plus. are kind of historic. Space shuttle Apollo, and now the soon to be the SpaceX. No, this is this is this is the happening place. That's where the VAB is. It's crazy. <laughs> Um, and fortunately, it's a place we've both been, so yes. we can talk about it. Um, so the other thing we're going to do is, uh, if you want to interact with us, you can 
You can tell that dog to be quiet. I'm uh, going to shut the door. Okay, so if you want to interact with us, you can use the Q&A app. So we've set that up, and so if you're watching this somewhere on YouTube, uh, you can just click that Fraser is interacting with the public or something, and then it'll bring you in. Be part of the conversation. You can, And I can see there's a bunch of people here already talking. Uh, you can vote up questions that you like. You can, And so feel free to post any questions you want or any ideas or any things that maybe we've missed. And if we don't get it during the show, we will stick around for a few minutes afterwards and answer your questions about space and astronomy. Not just the topic, uh, but also anything you want. People say we never answer questions. We always answer questions. Oh, yeah. No, you just have to watch us live. Well, people want to know what happened to the Q&A, uh, the question shows that we do, and they, they're just tagged on to the end of the episode. So, uh, Cool. Okay, great. Well, I'm ready to go. You ready to go? I, I believe I'm ready to go, and... Uh, there will be shows in the background. There needs to be a shout. I'm going to say hi to Nancy and Guido and Tony and Elad and Elad again and Michael Jobin and uh, yeah and Russell Turn, Bateman. So turning on Q and A app so I can see the awesomeness too. Yeah. Hi everybody. So hi everybody. Uh, okay, well, let's get rocking. Tell me when you're ready to press record. I am pressing record and it is recording and the levels look good. I have done the same and it is also good. A little low. Hmm. Get a little quiet. A little more. There we go. All right. Here we go. Astronomy Cast, episode 345, Launch Complex 39. Welcome to Astronomy Cast, our weekly facts based journey through the cosmos, where we help you understand not only what we know, but how we know what we know. My name is Fraser Kane. I'm the publisher of Universe Today, and with me is Dr. Pamela Gay, a professor at Southern Illinois University, Edwardsville and the director of CosmoQuest. Hey, Pamela, how are you doing? I'm doing well. I'm, I'm loving the fact that you and I seem to be in two totally different climate zones today. I'm, I'm doing the not willing to turn on the AC yet, but deeply wishing I had AC, and you're clearly doing the I still need heat. Yeah, people need to be watching us when we record this live on YouTube uh, every Monday at noon Pacific, and then they can see the, our various fashion choices. And, uh, yeah, it's kind of chilly here. So, But it was really hot, and now it's cold. So I don't know. How do you like your climate change now? Um, so, uh, so th before we get on to this week's show, just one last pitch for the CosmoQuest Hangout-a-thon fundraising. It's still going for a little while. Yes, yeah, so if you go to cosmoquest.org slash hangoutathon, you can still contribute. And the folks over at Planetary Resources, uh, for anyone who donates before May 18th, uh, they're going to give the largest individual donor a stunningly gorgeous uh, slice of meteorite that has some nice crystalline structures in it. And I'm, I'm really kind of thrilled and grateful for everyone out there who's contributed so far. Our median donation is just $30, and all of that has added up to... 20, over $24,000 in science coming. This is going to enable us to launch a new project to do citizen science studying Mars and uh, the more donations come in the more we're able to do, the more times we're able to say yes to scientists who have new and exciting citizen science projects that they just want uh, to see go into existence so they can well, discover our universe. Uh, so please go to cosmoquest.org slash hangoutathon, uh, all lowercase, and um, no amount is too small, but at the same time, no amount is too large. Uh, Go and ahead. I will <laughs> pause the podcast. We'll wait. And and I'm writing a handwritten thank you, well, a hand typed thank you to everybody. So, um, the thank yous actually come directly from me. Great. So thank you, in advance. Please give. Please. Please. <laughs> so the plan now is we're going to be doing a multi-part series on numbers in space. Um, so part one today is going to be uh, Launch Complex 39. Uh, how many have you thought we want to do, Pamela? Um, I'm still pulling them out. We do okay. have an interruption Memorial Day weekend. We're going to have a live episode from Balticon, so if any of you are in the Baltimore area Memorial Day weekend, I hope that I can see you at the con. Um, and other than that, send us ideas for science-y things, not like random places that have no science associated with right. them. Okay. So this idea is, so we're going to do Area 51, Launch Complex 39. It's it's that sort of a theme going. 42. Hmm. <laughs> um, okay, so almost every historic American launch occurred at one place in Cape Canaveral, Launch Complex 39. Good old LC-39 
was built for the Apollo spacecraft and then modified for the space shuttle program. And now it's carrying on this tradition for the upcoming SpaceX launches. Let's explore the history of this instrumental launch facility. And what's cool about this is we've both been to Launch Complex 39. We have. I, I was there for the launch of STS-123. Uh, and what were you there for? Uh, one, two, five, I think. One, we two, both, six. But we, we both but, did the, we've got to see one before. No. There's, no, I missed it. It didn't You launch. missed, but yeah. we tried. We tried, yeah. Yeah, I tried. I went down and I saw the space shuttle off on the horizon, just the nose of it. And they wouldn't even let us go out and do the tour of the shuttle because there oh, was no. like high wind and stuff. So, so no, we couldn't even, I didn't even get a chance to see it. So, uh, if it, yeah, so I still haven't actually seen a, a rocket launch. So, but I'm going to, I'm going to fix that now that SpaceX is coming back to the Cape. And Launch Complex 39 is going to get put back into use. And, and so, yeah. you know, and I mean, Launch Complex 39, the thing that's the most recognizable feature is the VAB, the Vehicle Assembly Building. So if you've seen that building, that's the place we're talking about. And, and what is so amazing about the, the VAB is it has doors that accommodate a Saturn V fully vertical being driven on a four-story crawler through the doors. And it, it's, it's a building of a size that you can't fully comprehend until there's a helicopter right next to it. So let's go back to the beginning then and let's talk about uh, this amazing facility and, and where it came from and, uh, and sort of what it's been used for. So, so I guess when did they start to decide that they were going to need something of the scale of, of Launch Complex 39? It, it really was born out of the Apollo era. Uh, prior to that, it, it, this piece of land has the strangest history. It was originally developed by a bunch of wealthy Harvard grads who basically wanted a clubhouse on the ocean. Um, and that just deeply amuses me to no end. And, and so out of their little clubhouse on the water, um, an Air Force base was built north of there in the 1900s. The Air Force base uh, in in the 19 in the late 1950s, early 1960s, got turned over to Project Mercury, um, and slowly but surely, uh, as NASA came into existence, that entire islandy bit got turned into Air Force Base plus NASA facility, and. Uh, it's a lot of it you can't get through unless you have a NASA badge, uh, but the the Google images are really quite spectacular. And what's also kind of cool is it's near the uh, Cape Canaveral cruise ship port as well. So um, you you have cruise ships that inadvertently park there and then get to have prime real estate for watching launches, and that also deeply amuses me. Um, so its history is basically, it's a nice piece of land right next to the ocean, pointed in the correct direction uh, to go launch over the ocean. It's, it's fairly far south. There was already an Air Force base there. So NASA just kept building. But, but I mean, Launch Complex 39, there's other stuff on that area. I mean, if you've ever seen yeah. Cape Canaveral, it, it's, it's this big, long isthmus of land that that sort of you know. But it's mostly like forest and swamp and and crocodile uh, and or crocodiles. alligator weather. Yeah, 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 gators. And um, but then the launch complex is just one chunk. There's other stuff on this. And there's multiple launch con complexes. Yeah. So so. Launch co Complex 39 is is the most iconic. It it I wouldn't say most historic like you did simply because uh, there there's all of the Mercury and Gemini stuff that happened as well. There's the landing strips that get used for ferrying stuff around, but Launch Complex 39 it was originally envisioned as a five pad uh, structure that they'd be using to launch Apollo after Apollo after Apollo. People don't realize that just like the space shuttle program got deeply curtailed, um, the Apollo program's facilities got deeply curtailed as well. So instead of building all five, uh, they, they ended up building pads B and C and then realizing that sounded kind of stupid and so they renamed C to A. Um, but it's, it's a complex of two instead of five pads, the vehicle assembly building, and the roads for the crawlers. And there's actually this really neat 
a point out on the roads for the crawlers where you're like, huh, the road keeps going. And the reason it keeps going is because of the plans for future launch pads. And that land is still there, and there's still the capacity to add more launch pads someday in the future. Someday. So then let's... So then I guess it got set up for the Apollo mission, and so that was sort of the original requirements for this whole facility. Yes. So, so break it down for me then. I mean, how did the launch facility get used from, I guess, when all the parts arrived at Cape Canaveral to when they, they blasted off? So, so just like if you've ever played Kerbal Space, which I've now watched people do, Fraser can stop like speaking a foreign language I don't understand. Uh, just like with Kerbal, the vehicle assembly building down at the Kennedy Space Flight Center allows the different rocket components to be put one on top of the other uh, using a, sense, a series of, of cranes and harnesses basically and they'd construct all of the parts of the Saturn rockets and later the space shuttle program inside this giant essentially a warehouse and well, all the parts are, have come from all over the place, right? Like they bring in the, yeah. the space shuttle boosters on trains coming from... Barges. Yeah, they have pieces come in on barges, and then it all just gets assembled in this amazing building. Yes, and, and so they construct everything up on top of this four-story tall crawler. Uh, they've switched up crawlers since the Apollo age. And back in the Apollo age, it wasn't just... The, the Apollo rocket that they were assembling, they also had part of the uh, launch tower that got assembled up on top of that crawler as well. And so you have the launch platform, the, the attached uh, launch arm, and all of this gets assembled one piece at a time, stacked up on top of each other. And then with the Apollo missions, they rolled them all the way out, slowly but surely, down the crawler trail. Well, hold, hold on, sorry. Just before we go any further, have you got any ridiculous statistics on the VAB? I just want, you know, any like... Um, so, so my favorite ridiculous statistic on it is it was the tallest building in Florida for several years at 160 meters tall. It was eventually supplanted by a uh, insurance building. And my other stupid statistic on it is if you look at a picture of it, there's a big US flag on one side of the more modern pictures of it. And each stripe on that modern uh, building's flag is the width of a school bus. <laughs> the stars are like bigger than people, right? Yeah, yeah, they yeah. are. Um, so I got some more stuff here. So one thing that they, when I went and they told us was it's got its own weather system. Yes, yes. So, so you can have clouds up above inside the, uh, inside the VAB. Um, it's got 71 cranes inside of it. Uh, it's eight Have you acres. got to go inside the VAB? No. Yeah, I haven't either. No, it's got eight acres inside. So just imagine, like, if you know... An, an acre of land, eight of those. Uh, and so it encloses 3.6 million cubic meters of space. Yeah, it's big. It's it's just mental, yeah. And, and it had, yeah, all kinds of, I forget what it was. It was like the largest, for a while there, it was the largest building in the world. And then it all depends no, on how largest, you measure it. No, largest building in Florida. Or yeah, but I mean, building in Florida. Yeah, but like for just like volume. Oh, stuff. enclosed yeah. volume. Yeah, but I think the the Boeing facility is bigger now. I've been to that. I've been inside that, and it's mentally huge. Yeah. Um. Okay. Great. So anyway, so we've got the we've got this rocket. It's been it's been assembled like the Kerbal Space Program in the VAB, and then it's crawled out to places unknown. And well, they know exactly where it's going, so it's places known. It's either going to 39A or 39B. Pick one. Um. And once once this happened, they, they rolled it out and they connected it to the launch tower that was out there. And this had a whole series of little connectors that allowed them to do fueling, cooling, get the astronauts back and forth, get people who were working on the cargo back and forth. So they're essentially building and unbuilding a multi-story structure every time they do a launch. Uh, so there's the, the fixed launch pad, the mobile, and, and it was able to swing back and forth for the space shuttle one. Um, 
and and with all of this construction with all of the cement they had to put down to support this massive structure on the swamplands of Florida uh, one of the other things they had to figure out how to do was dampen the acoustical noise because otherwise you're going to start shattering things with sound and that's never a good thing uh, so they they had a sound dampening system which basically meant they had a giant water tank and they'd flood the launch pad uh, just prior to, to launch and that would dampen the acoustical noise. Uh, they, they actually had a, a white room for the astronauts up at the top of the tower where you'd go up the tower in the elevator and there's a room that you can keep your astronauts nice and safe and temperature controlled in. And then there's these scary little bridges, at least to me they're scary little bridges that go from these many story high launch towers uh, walk across this little tiny bridge, and then you climb into your capsule. And those those crawlers, they go so slow. They just go like a mile an hour, I think, and just slowly crawls. It takes all day from when they leave the vehicle assembly building to when they've actually reached the, the launch pad. There's great video of, of people walking alongside this thing and just to see the yeah. scale. You just imagine. I mean, you don't want to tip. You can just imagine, like, that's about as fast as you could accelerate to, to ha without having this rocket tip over. <laughs> so, so what was kind of amazing is is the crawlers themselves weighed six million pounds. That's two point seven thousand tons. Um, so, the crawlers themselves were tiny compared to the spacecraft, and and these these are really scales that human brains just don't cope with really well. And it, it's interesting to see how, how all of this has slowly changed over time. So we started with Apollo, uh, and they had to figure out everything with Apollo. So they had uh, flame deflectors, they had flame deflectors, they had acoustical dampeners, uh, all of these different ways to try and keep people safe. They had an emergency evacuation system, which was a fancy word for a zip line uh, that, to allow you to go from the top to the bottom very quickly in a uh, controlled, non-death kind of manner. Um, but then they had to innovate everything again for the significantly smaller space shuttles. Uh, so the VAB itself got re reconfigured so that they could roll the space shuttles in and their little tails could go up through the top of a notch in the doors. Um, they had to reconfigure how the cranes work on the inside because now instead of stacking things, they're having to mate them side by side. And then with the space shuttle, there was the issue of they have the cargo bays, and the cargo bays, it, that's completely new. They didn't have that during the Apollo era. so they had to reconfigure how the launch pads work so that they have a basically set of mobile swingable scaffolding that can swing out to allow people to access everything inside the cargo bay as needed. Um, check on cargo, connect batteries, unconnect batteries, the whole nine, nine yards, and then swing that away. So I've seen the space shuttle out on the pad, but I've only seen it when it was covered up with this arm, and, and it's just, it really looks like a construction site when, when that swing-in arm is, is in place covering up the cargo bay. And they, Yeah, it's like a big metal glove that's sort of yeah. wrapped around a whole part of the space shuttle, and then as they're just in, just about to make their preparations to launch, they'll swing this this whole arm back, and then I guess that leaves the shuttle a little more exposed and a little more inaccessible for that for that time until they actually, you know, launch it off. And then if they need to, they could they could bring that 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 uh, that array back in and and hold it snugly again. And and they also with the space shuttle, they changed how. The, the rocket is fueled. Uh, so with the space shuttle, they had the two side solid rocket boosters, but then they also had the central liquid fuel booster. And so they had to be able to pump that full of all the different fuels. So we're looking mostly at liquid oxygen as our troublemaker. And so they had to have a cap up on top of it that would recapture all of the vented gas that was coming out and wouldn't vent all of it out into the atmosphere and lose it. So they had to add all sorts of new and advanced systems. Um, and so every time we go to use these, we have to change how they're used. Uh, think about new concerns, new uh, 
ways to protect both the people in the spacecraft and also the land around the spacecraft. And so on a typical mission then, let's just kind of go back to the beginning. So they would they would bring all the parts, they would assemble it, either stack it up, like as you said, Kerbal Space Program, or, or side mate it for the space shuttle. They would then crawl it out to the launch pad a few days, sometimes weeks before the launch. It would the crawler would be able to sort of turn and go to one or the other of the of the launch pads, either A or B. And then what would happen on launch day? So on, on launch day, you would either swing away or drop away the unwanted part of the launch tower, the mobile part of the launch tower, and uh, load your astronauts in, then drop the bridges uh, at a certain T-minus moment. And then prior to uh, ignition of the, the engines, you'd flood everything with water so that you could damp the acoustical noise. And one of the most disconcerting things is when those engines fire, they, of course, generate vast amounts of steam. So for a few moments, you actually lose sight of your spacecraft and all of this steam. And the first time I saw that, I had this moment of, oh, oh, dear, is that supposed to happen? Cause right. I, it, oh, no, is it exploding? <laughs> yeah. Yes, exactly. Um, and then as they take off, what's kind of cool is, is the dolphins will sometimes l jump up out of the water to see hey, what's going on, um, and all the birds fly away in terror. Smart, and sometimes frogs fly through the air, roasted by steam. Um, so, okay, so, so now that's sort of, the, I mean, Launch Complex 39 was last used with the last space shuttle launch. Is that right? Well, so they actually did use one of the launch pads with the RE series rockets. Uh, back during the Constellation program, which NASA has set, since canceled, they were trying to come up with a new series of rockets. And uh, so they did use one of the, the Launch Complex 39s to do that one and only ever test firing of an Ares rocket. Uh, but now they're in the process of doing massive reconstruction out there. And uh, some of the reconstruction was started while the space shuttle program was still going on. Uh, they uh, started on B first doing uh, massive additions of lightning poles. Uh, and, and as they did all of this, the idea was to create a new clean launch pad. So you basically have big thing of cement, drive your vehicle out, plop it down on the clean launch pad, and they had permanent grounded lightning attractors around it so that the poles would get hit instead of the spacecraft. And what's neat about this is NASA was already thinking ahead when they started doing this to using this launch complex for commercial launches. So what we're looking at right now is um, 39A is is in the process of getting reconfigured by SpaceX to be used for their Falcon series. So in 2015, hopefully during first quarter of 2015, uh, they're going to be using it to launch the Falcon Heavy. And yeah. uh, what's kind of awesome is this may also be uh, our return to the moon for um, everyday people in some ways. But instead of sending humans, it's going to be uh, some of the Google Lunar X Prize teams are, are scheduled to launch in some of those early Q1 2015 flights. Um, so we have that to look forward to. And here, SpaceX didn't get the vehicle assembly building. That's not theirs. So they're actually looking to assemble their rockets horizontal, roll them out, and stand them up. And I find that a little bit terrifying, but that's the future we're looking at. Well, that's the way the Russians do it, right? When you yeah. see the protons and the Soyuz, they they make this tr this trip from where they're constructed to uh, the Baikonur Cosmodrome in Kazakhstan, and then and then they're they're lifted up in this yeah. crazy structure. Same kind of thing. They've got this this launch array that then pulls back. People won't be able to see the video, but I'm making all kinds of hand gestures and <laughs> and sort of pull back, and then the and then the rocket's able to launch. But but the scale is the trick, right? Like the, yeah. the Ares Five and the Falcon Heavy are gonna be monster rockets. So it's gonna be a lot tougher than just the regular Falcon to to try and do that trick. And and 
what what's interesting to me is the VAB is still going to be in use by NASA for a set of rockets that nominally one hopes are going to start launching in 2017 maybe this is the space launch system NASA hasn't given up on building its own sets of rockets and so they've kept the inter they've kept the VAB for themselves and the idea is that this new space launch system will be used uh, to launch uh, as a backup for launching crews as uh, a way of launching different spacecraft they're they're planning uh, nominally to start doing uh, lunar flybys again in the future and hopefully by no later than 2021 they're saying uh, return humans to the moon. Now, I'm not sure how I feel about any of these time scales because we've been watching SpaceX for years slowly build up to getting their launch craft going, testing out their different Dragon capsules. I feel extremely confident about the SpaceX series. But the space launch systems we haven't seen yet. And, and while they are working to uh, build on past space technologies building on the space shuttle technology in particular um, I don't know if using it to get to the moon by 2021 is a realistic assessment but this is why I don't demand space flight because I am bitterly deeply pessimistic about our ability to complete rockets on time Right, and this is this is the kind of conversation that we tend to have on the weekly space hangout. So I'm not going to go into one of my rants, my classic rants, in here here on Astronomy Cast, which we hope is an episode that will stand the test of time. The the news, the history we're providing on on Launch Complex 39 will always be the same. Uh, so uh, so yeah, so good so good luck, SpaceX. We hope uh, we hope that works out well for you, and good and, luck and to the hey. space launch system. Maybe you and I can be that down there in 2015 to see a launch. That that would be an awesome way to spend a winter day. Done. It's a it's a date. All right. Well, thanks a lot, Pamela. My pleasure. That was a great ending note. That we've decided in 2015 we're gonna go and watch the rocket launch. All right. Yes. Now is that okay, NASA? Can we do that, please? <laughs> I will find a way to make it happen. Oh yeah. No, no, they. They let us. They let us go there and watch their rockets launch. Okay, everyone, hang tough. We will uh, answer some questions. Yep. But no. Oh, Surly Amy see. has new planet-based jewelry. She just tweeted a picture of something that can't physically exist, but is still very pretty. Is Surly Amy sponsoring this podcast? No, I'm simply uh, looking for, for questions on Twitter and then okay. salivating over her jewelry, I see. which I happen to be wearing, so I guess, yeah. Yes. All right. <laughs> I'm an unpaid advertiser, I think. <laughs> um, so Tony Lynch says the VAB is the sixth largest building by usable space. Okay. Yeah. You are getting uh, your comments slightly earlier than I am. Uh. Well, I'm getting them from the QA. So let's see. Yeah, so here's what Wikipedia yeah. says. Uh, the largest buildings in the world by volume. Um, it is the largest single-story building in the world and was the tallest building in Florida until 1974 and is still the tallest building in the United States outside an urban area. Okay. So, um, Guido Bibra notes that I've just discovered that you can explore most of Cape Canaveral, including the ways to the launch pad with Google Street View, and the most recent images on Google Earth are from February 2014. So that's cool. I didn't know you could do cool. Street View for the whole complex. Yeah. That's fantastic. Neat. Um, all right. I love these stories. If you've been to Launch Complex 39, if you've seen a shuttle launch, please give us some of your stories because in the uh, in the Q and A app, um, there, there's an amazing eagle's nest on the road from yeah, the visitor yeah, no. center out to the launch complex. Uh, Nancy Graziano says, "I never made it to a launch, but we were at KSC for one of the shuttle landings. It came from the north, and we heard the dual booms. And as we we're headed up on the bus for the tour, the shuttle with the returning astronauts passed in front of us. That is awesome." That's yeah, cool. I haven't seen a landing either. That would be amazing. Oh, I saw them when I was a little kid, but I only saw them at, at the, hey, those contrails up there are space shuttle level. 
Uh, Tony Lynch, STS-125 was launched from 39A. I was lucky to be at that launch. I think it may have been the last launch from 39A. Yeah, I think 126 was the last shuttle launch. I'm trying to think if I can get my math right. I shouldn't be saying these kinds of things. Um, I think 125 was the one I tried to see, and it had a it had a like a leak, and so they took like a month. And so you I were actually took, so angry. I was pretty mad. Well, you know, well, because I just to give you the story. So my my father was the person who got me into space, being excited about space and astronomy when I was a kid, and he woke me up in 1981 to watch the first space shuttle launch, and it was. It was like nine o'clock West Coast East Coast time, but it was like six in the morning East Coast West Coast time. So, so we got up at like six in the morning and we watched the whole shuttle launch together. And so, uh, when the shuttles were starting to to gear down and they were gonna, they only had a couple more shuttle launches left. I was like, okay, I gotta go see a shuttle launch, and I gotta take my dad. And I'm really fortunate because my father is a professional photographer. So I figured, okay. I will take my dad. He will be the photographer. I'll write the stories. He'll he'll take the pictures and 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 we'll write some stories for Universe Today. And uh, so we got out there and took a bunch of great pictures and put a you know put a bunch of great stories in, but no shuttle launched. And so we uh, we spent a couple of days kicking around the area, and then we had to, we ran out of time. And we had to go and and good thing because we weren't going to wait for a month <laughs> for the, yeah. the shuttle to launch. So. So the plan is at some point maybe a you know a SpaceX will go back and take another crack at it. Elon, can you can make that happen? Um, what else have we got? Uh, Michael Jobin says I would like to see the launch of the FT1 Orion and I would see the launch of the FT1 Orion and three Delta Fours. Are you saying that you have seen that? Orion didn't exist. Yeah. No, but they no, they, but they did the test flight of the Orion, right? Didn't they do the test flight of the they, Ares? They test they test fired the engines. They didn't launch it. Yeah. They just made uh, a mess. <laughs> um, Tom Nathy asks, "What's the latest information on Bigelow Space?" I don't know. Um, they've been testing new inflatables. Uh, they're they're still on target. Uh, they just they they've bought various launches and they have their two orbiters right now. Um, yeah, last time I looked, everything was looking good and shiny. Sorry, uh, that was very unspecific, but it, it's, it's commercial space. There's new YouTube videos coming out all the time, and I simply squee when I look at them. Yeah. Uh, man, I think we're out of questions today. Um, Tal Day is May 25th. <laughs> there you go. Tal Day is May 25th. Thanks, Guido. <laughs> Um, anything else? Uh, Mr. Magard says, FYI, Copenhagen Suborbitals will test their turbo-pumped liquid fuel engine in a 90-second burn on Sunday, May 25th. Cool. And you can see a sound suppression system in operation. That sounds great. Yeah, that the sounds. The only problem with the sound suppression system is it tends to do bad things to the alligators that like to like hang out down there. They must have. Fences that stop gators from from getting you in. You can't there. really stop a gator. <laughs> right. Um, There's so, the rats of Florida. Yeah, and so you know we're talking about SpaceX, and so one of the things that has recently happened, you know, if people aren't aware, uh, on on the most previous launch, the one that they actually went and resupplied the International Space Station, they had their their bottom stage with its landing legs and its its reentry system built in, and the only footage was this terrible, crappy, uh, like one frame of usable. You could see ocean below, and the legs of the rocket extended, and then that was all they saw. And so the plan was actually on Saturday they were going to have their next their next launch. They're going to test the system out again, but unfortunately there was a fuel leak with the SpaceX system, and so now it's going to be another probably again another month before they've worked this out and, and get a chance to test this out. So. We're still waiting, but hopefully this will be the one where they'll get a chance to test and actually see if this if this system works. And if this works, in the future the plan is and just like just imagine this, right? You've got these rockets taking off from 39. They're flying up. They're releasing their cargo, and then they're returning landing. and landing back at the launch pad. 
No more rescuing them from the ocean with tugboats. Yeah, yeah, it'll be uh, it'll be unbelievable if they can actually pull this off. I'm really, really excited to see sort of where this progresses because the goal is that you will not need to just throw your rockets away every time you use them. And and Elon Musk uses this what? example, right? It's imagine if you took a a flight from from the U.S. to Europe and you had to throw away your fifty million dollar airliner every time you did it. What, what I'm intrigued to see is they found with the space shuttle that the refurb costs between launches was significantly greater because it was a refurb instead of starting from scratch. And sometimes, I mean, we've all been there with home repairs. It's like, damn it, it would just be cheaper if I... Tear it all out and yes, build yes. a new one. Yeah. Um, so I'm interesting to, interested to see just how the economics ends up working out. Uh, what what also intrigues me is I know that he's someone who believes firmly instead of renting, instead of buying, and uh, this is the opposite of that. So I'm just there's many intrigues. For, yeah, I, I can't yeah. wait to see all of it. How, yeah, how many times can you contain a detonation in your titanium and aluminum tube before you need to throw out that titanium and aluminum aluminum tube and and start with a new one? So. Cool. Okay. Well, I don't see any other questions. So, uh, thanks everyone for watching. Pamela, thanks for and please brain. share out our Hangoutathon information. You guys who are in our day-to-day -day audience have done so right by us. I'm not asking for more money from you. Well, I did that earlier. Um, but go <laughs> find other people, and and there's got to be an angel investor out there somewhere, and that's we need that angel. All so right. Thank you. All right. Well, thanks, everyone, for watching. Uh, what's next up, Pamela? Uh, next up is going to be Learning Space, and we've moved them to a new time. I believe that it's going up at noon Pacific on Wednesday. Oh, and there's a Google Lunar X Prize uh, team hangout tomorrow. I'll be hosting that. Um, and that is at 8 a.m. Pacific, uh, 11 a.m. Eastern. I think that makes it 4 p.m. London. So tomorrow's the Google Lunar X Prize team hangout. That's fantastic. Okay, great. And then on Friday, of course, we have the Week of Space Hangout. And hopefully on Sunday, we'll have another virtual star party. So Sounds great. Space, space, space. All right. Thanks, Pamela. Thanks, everyone. We will see you all next time. Goodbye. <laughs>